Okay, I started. Let's see if it works. You know, so you connected on back. Yeah. But no one on Zoom spoke, I guess, or we didn't hear them. Someone's to hear that. No one's. It okay. seems to be working now. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Good. So I don't need to do anything. They can. Hear. Can you hear me? On Zoom. Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. We're faster than last time. We can hear and see. Thank you. Ordering of events need to be different. You hide the video panel first, and then you hide the floating meeting controls. If you do it out of order, one of them stays there. User interface design 101. Don't let the user choose ordering. Like memory ordering, right? You don't expose memory ordering to the programmer. Okay, uh, well, why is this? Oh, yeah. The same thing. Is it here? Uh, I do video panel. Yeah. And then how do I get rid of this? You cannot. When you're screen sharing. Oh, I'm screen sharing, so I cannot get rid of this part? I think so. User interface design 102. It's already the screen. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, this is all you need. Okay, okay. Uh, it's not terrible. Okay. Okay, I mean, I didn't know what to talk about in this lecture, so I'm going to talk about some research. But then also, I'm going to do something else. Uh, so feel free to ask questions. So some of you may be interested in research, so I decided I will spend some time here. Uh, does it sound good? Yeah, okay. Okay, let's go through. And feel free to ask questions because I don't intend to cover a whole lot of research except just to get an overview of the introduction uh, or with the group. Because you've already seen some of the research topics that is actually our group works on, right? Mohammed talks about, talk about genome analysis. That's a huge direction in the group and both from software and hardware aspe aspects. Uh, Juan talked about memory-centric computing in memory processing. That's another huge area in the group. I talked about Rohammer and DRAM. That's another huge area. So, so you've already been exposed to actually three major areas. And uh, in a way, that's better than what I can do in one single lecture. Uh, but I'm going to talk about some uh, other things. Well, I'm going to skip some of these things because these slides were <laughs> used for a different purpose. So hopefully everybody knows me. Feel free to ask questions. And you may have seen this picture if you've taken DDCA. I like this. One of your colleagues in DDCA. Uh, is very good at art, so she made this. You can probably buy it for some month, but I asked her for permission. <laughs> okay, and then another one, <laughs> and you can find the links. Anyway, basically, uh, I think Mohammed also mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but this is what we do in Safari. Uh, our goal is to build fundamentally better computers uh, and systems in general, uh, and computers very general, right? It's not hardware, it's not software, it's computers. Right? In the end, hardware and software there are a lot of trade-offs in the hardware software space, so it's good not to divide people into hardware versus software, in my opinion. Uh, but it's good to know if you, if you know everything, right? If you try to uh, do system design across the stack. And we focus on computer architecture, hardware software, co-design systems, bioinformatics, and security. And who knows what else? So as a researcher, I think it's important to keep your uh, mind open and be opportunistic, right? Uh, that's a good thing to do. So these are some, uh, these are, I think, incomplete, but uh, some key problems that we see in computer architecture, computer systems, computing today. How do you make things more secure, more reliable, more safe? We talked about that with a specific study of Rohammer last time, but there's also a lot of other interesting issues in security, reliability, safety. Uh, so we actually look a lot into this. Again, I will not go into a lot of detail, but this is a major direction in the group. Uh, so there could be vulnerabilities, especially hardware vulnerabilities are quite interesting in my opinion, in memory storage and processors, because these are hard to 
patch, if you will. Software vulnerabilities are also interesting, but a lot of them are, let's say, preventable in software. Whereas hardware vulnerabilities, if you actually have them, you need to change something in hardware. And how do you design something fundamentally trustworthy is a very difficult question, I think. Uh, your circuits need to be trustworthy and side channel free, for example, right? People figured out ways of using side channels and processors to extract secret keys. If you, if you lose your secret key, all of your cryptography protocols are useless space. This is why hardware is so important, I think, in terms of security, right? Your trust is built on the fact that you cannot expose a secret key to someone. But if someone figures that out using side channel analysis, like power analysis or some other side channels that exist in the processors or row hammer, actually people have shown that uh, basically different types of vulnerabilities, uh, then your trust is broken. There's something on chat, but I think I looked at it already. There's someone asking questions. Maybe you guys can. I just can hear. Okay, I can hear us. That's good. Okay, and then uh, I mean we talked about road hammer as an example, but there's a broader uh, area over there. And then fundamentally, energy efficient architectures. This is I think uh, very important to look into. How do we design architectures to consume as minimal energy as possible, uh, while also not uh, hampering computation? Right. I think memory centric architectures. We've been discussing in earlier lectures is a key example of this. Uh, certainly, near uh, we, we discussed uh, processing near memory and processing using memory as two types of uh, processing in memory, right? And I think these are really fundamental. Uh, I've seen a lot of terminology in in memory processing, and what's really fundamental is the distinction between these two. It's not fundamental that you do the processing inside the chip or outside the chip uh, or near or somewhere near the chip. What's really fundamental is are you, do, you, do you add logic uh, to do the computation? And where does that logic sit? Is it near the memory? Today, basically, we have processor here, memory here. Get the processor closer and closer and closer and closer to memory. It could be inside the memory chip. It could be near the bank, whatever. But as long as you add logic, that's processing near memory or logic near memory. This is very fundamental, I think. It, in a sense, it's very similar to the current model, right? You have the processor far away. You just put it closer. And the processor could be an accelerator, subset of the accelerator, subset of the ISA. It could be a GPU, it could be a CPU, it could be an FPGA. It's the same, basically. Processing gets close to the logic, uh, close to memory. But the other part uh, is uh, what we call processing using memory. And I think that's fundamentally different from the first one. Basically, you have processor memory, you forget about the processor. Right? In that case, you just have memory. Now, this memory device can do computation, as Juan mentioned, right, uh, in Ambit, for example. And that memory device has some analog operational properties that enable that is to, it to do computation. And we do a lot of work in that area. And this is very fundamentally different because you don't actually add any logic there. Uh, of course, you can combine these two paradigms. You can add some logic plus uh, exploit uh, the memory's computation capability, which I think should happen also going into the future. But that processing using memory is also very interesting and fundamentally more efficient uh, because uh, you don't add any logic to the computation. The question is, of course, at what things is this fundamentally more efficient and how do you make sure it works? So, so there are a lot of issues over here, right? And you guys remember the processing in memory lecture or memory centric computing lecture. So now you have a, a good idea of this uh, direction also. And feel free to ask questions also. <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming you remember it from the lecture. So we're looking on the low latency and predictable architecture. It's actually really important. I think, oh, before I go into it, I think, for example, this the processing near memory and using memory, you can do this in all memory devices. And I'm actually quite interested in many different devices. Uh, DRAM, we've been talking about it a lot, but there's storage SSDs, uh, there's emerging memory technologies, and all of them have the capability to do processing using memory, some analog computation capable. And it's really good, at, uh, good to look at how to do that and how to exploit it for applications and how to make it easily programmable. So Juan mentioned the SIM DRAM, for example. I don't remember if anyone selected that this time, but we discussed in seminars, past incarnations of the seminar. Uh, so that uh, goes, uh, that takes a step towards more programmability of this analog computation in memory. Uh, and again, as I, as I said, fundamentally energy efficient. So memory centric architectures improve performance, energy efficiency, both of them at the same time. But energy efficiency is really key, in my opinion, because people try to improve performance in many different ways. Uh, but it's very difficult to improve energy efficiency and performance. Uh, if you make the system complicated. And I think memory-centric architectures uh, take us towards a direction where fundamentally the computation is very efficient because you don't move the data or and you exploit the analog computation characteristics. Uh, 
And then how do you actually make it very high performance also becomes interesting. So there are a lot of interesting things over here. Memory is also very parallel, right? You have, imagine this uh, petabytes of memory. If actually all of the cells are doing computation at the same time, that parallelism is much larger than what parallelism you have in the processors uh, today. Just because of the sheer uh, amount of memory uh, that we have, right? Uh, if you actually look at, look at the transistor counts, I think I've shown this in a DDCA lecture uh, this semester, but in, in a huge supercomputer, more than 97 or 98% of the transistors are dedicated to memory. In, I, I don't believe the num this number includes storage, but memory, DRAM, for example, because it's much denser. Right? Memory is much denser. So low latency and predictability, these are actually quite important topics. We have been doing a lot of memory controller research uh, to reduce latency, to make things more predictable. I think these are very important going into the future. Uh, and the difference between them, I, even though I couple them into two uh, areas, I think these are two, these two are very different things actually. Low latency means you should get the result fast, right? Predictable means you don't care how fast, as long as you can predict when you're gonna get the result. My favorite example is, is the tram or train schedules. If you've taken EDCA, you remember this example probably. I don't care if the tram is fast. I care if the tram leaves at the time it promises to leave. If the tram is fast, it leaves two minutes earlier and I'm not there. So I miss it. But if the tram leaves at the time it promises, then it's predictable and I can plan around it. So that's the two difference between, difference between these two things. Uh, and Think about it. So quality of service is very different from latency in general. Of course, if the promise is it's very latency, high, high latency, low latency and high throughput, you should satisfy it while not uh, destroying the predictability. In existing architecture, there's a lot of resource sharing. So uh, predictability becomes a problem because you're running a lot of programs, for example. How do you predict, uh, how, do you, how do you guarantee uh, that uh, the execution time of a program that you promised uh, to some? Or if you're running a cloud uh, server, for example, how do you guarantee uh, that a person's program is not going to be destroyed by another person's program because you're running them concurrently for efficiency reasons, right? So these are actually really interesting things uh, that are going on uh, also in the broader field. And then we've talked a lot about architectures for genomics, uh, but we also do research in architectures for machine learning and broader medicine and health. And I think it's specifically in this machine learning part, we also do a lot of work on using machine learning to improve architectures. So for example, how do you design a memory controller that makes better decisions uh, in hardware? So we've been working on reinforcement learning based memory controllers, for example, prefetchers that use reinforcement learning uh, or neural networks. Uh, more recently, I think we had a paper at Micro. Uh, the idea was basically, Rahul uh, drew this idea. If he was there, he could give a lecture also on that. But basically the idea is to predict which uh, load requests are going to miss in the on-chip cache hierarchy uh, so that you can actually start the request early. So if you think about today's on-chip cache hierarchies, you have the L1, L2, L3, L4 caches. They're huge. And it takes a long time to query those caches, around 50 cycles or so, maybe more in the future. Uh, can we somehow predict that a load is not going to find its data in any of those caches so that we can start the memory access, main memory access earlier? And Rahul designed a mechanism called Hermes that uses perceptrons, which is a very simple model of neurons that were developed in 1950s uh, uh, to do this prediction. It's a micro 2022 paper. It was it won the best paper award, actually. You can find it online. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but if people are interested, is it, is it going to be presented in this lecture, in this seminar? You can take a look, perhaps. I don't remember. I think multiple people expressed interest, but I don't remember if you selected that paper in the end. So basically, how do you improve the decision making that's going on in the architecture is a very important thing. So people have used a lot of heuristics so far. Can we make it more robust using uh, machine learning techniques is uh, becoming very interesting. Similarly, we had one work uh, last year, again, ISCA, it's called Sybil. Uh, there, the idea was to use reinforcement learning to decide which data should be placed in what kind of SSD uh, to maximize performance and energy uh, consumption. It's not, okay. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna see it in some other way perhaps. Okay, so basically uh, this is another area that uh, is very important and I, I'm, I'm gonna get back to that also. I mean, I think we mentioned this earlier, but uh, we usually take a very broad view of computer architecture. 
and look at algorithms through devices as much as possible. Uh, for example, in the processing using memory work, uh, devices uh, or circuits have some capability to do analog computation. How do you change the algorithm to take advantage of that analog computation? I think that's a great example of algorithms through devices uh, because that analog computation is fundamentally different from what we do. It's basically bitwise, block bitwise analog computation you do. Uh, you, you can operate uh, using uh, majority operations or bulk device ends or uh, ors or nots uh, on eight kilobytes of data, let's say, within a single subarray. And if you can do that on millions of bytes of data in parallel, how do you change the algorithm actually to take advantage of this? Okay. It's possible to do that. So that's an example. Okay. And similarly, you can actually apply that to uh, bioinformatics workloads, for example, right? How do you take advantage of processing using memory for bioinformatics? Or processing near memory for bioinformatics. Okay, I think I, uh, we, Mohammed uh, discussed this. I think, uh, and we've seen you've seen examples of this, like the uh, work we do in genome analysis acceleration is an example of this expanded view specialization. Uh, machine learning is another example of that view. Uh, processing in memory is also uh, another example of that view. I would say because it really changed, disrupts the entire stack. Okay, and we also. Uh, uh, examine ideas. So ideas are the most important thing in progress, I would say, in scientific progress. You come up with an idea, it may not be easily implementable, but you basically look at how to make it work over time. And that's, in my opinion, that's a very good kind of research. You, and th that's a spark, basically. You generate a spark, uh, and then you basically explore how that spark affects things, right? Uh, so with, uh, again, I'll pick processing using memory as an example, but you have this idea of multiple row activation, and if you do it concurrently, what kind of benefits do you get? It basically opens up a whole world of opportunities after that. Okay, so this is a very busy slide that talks about maybe in more detail what we do. Uh, so I think uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but we're, uh, we're very interested in emerging non-volatile memory technologies like phase change memory, RAM, uh, unifying memory and storage using a single interface. Uh, so that you can get rid of a lot of inefficiency in data management in existing systems. If you look at the existing systems, you have memory, storage, they're managed completely differently, right? You have to move the data between storage to then memory and memory and storage. Can you actually have a single unified view of memory and storage? And this could be possible with emerging technologies that enable uh, fast access to large amounts of data in a non-volatile fashion. So one of the reasons why storage and memory evolved very differently uh, over time is because of the devices. So DRAMs, for example, fast, uh, but volatile. When you power it off, you lose the data. Storage, uh, SSDs today, but hard disks in the past. Well, still today, but <laughs> hard disks are, hard disks still exist today because they actually have a very good cost point uh, compared to SSDs. Uh, uh, they, they are devices that are, that are non-volatile. You plug, up, plug off the power, the data still remains, so you can actually do manipulation of persistent data structures. Uh, but unfortunately, they're very slow compared to DRAM today. So if you have an emerging memory technology that's similarly fast as DRAM, but also non-volatile, now that enables opportunities that were not possible before. And this is something that uh, we've been looking at for some time. Uh, I think there's more to do over here. I mean, I, I think I already said the low latency and predictable architectures. This is. I think Juan also mentioned the data centric architecture. We want low latency in architectures. If, if your goal is to design a data centric system, data access should be low latency. So having high latency is not very good for if, you, if you're bottlenecked by data in the end. We talked about security, reliability, safety. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on here. Our acceleration for machine learning, AI genomics, health, medicine, et cetera. So there's a lot of work here, actually. We do we, our, our work spans uh, a lot of areas. It includes FPGAs, GPUs, uh, ex specialized accelerators, uh, also uh, processing in memory, and how to take advantage of all of them together. So there's there's a lot of work to talk about here if you're interested. And then I think this is something that I mentioned earlier. How do you design data-driven architectures, machine learning uh, driven architectures, controllers, and make them more intelligent? And then the data aware architecture, this is something that we do not discuss as much, but basically the idea here is to, uh, if you look at today's architectures, uh, they don't communicate a lot of information about the semantic properties of data uh, to the underlying hardware or the system. 
So if you look at data, it has a lot of properties, right? Uh, when I look at a piece of data, it has some security properties. Usually it's not specified actually in the software. Even the software designer may not think about it. It has some privacy property actually. A lot of genomic data has a lot of privacy constraints on it. And even a lot of data has a lot of privacy constraints on it today, right? Uh, it has some property, approximability property, meaning if you get bit flips on this data, there are some error tolerance you have. Uh, it has some uh, compressibility property based on some, uh, some compression algorithms work well, some compression algorithms don't work well. So it has a lot of properties, locality properties, potentially also how many times it's reused given some access pattern. So all of these properties exist for data. Uh, can we actually express these properties nicely to the architecture such that the architecture can take advantage of it? Right? For example, if you're dealing with security critical data, can you, uh, uh, can you actually uh, ensure that that security critical data doesn't get exposed to some other program using a side channel? Right? So that's why I think there's a lot of potential over here in terms of uh, making the architectures more data char characteristics aware. Can we express these characteristics uh, to uh, the underlying architecture and the underlying architecture can use them to improve performance, energy, security, reliability, et cetera. So there's a lot of interesting work, in my opinion, in this area also. And we have some papers uh, that were written in the past. In fact, Altabar presented a paper called Metasys, uh, right, at high peak earlier this year. Uh, that talks about that basically presented a PJB's infrastructure uh, that enables you to do real experiments uh, using this sort of expressive memory architecture. That was a prototype. So initially, when we wrote the paper in 2018, it was basically simulation. Can we express uh, uh, the characteristics of data so that we, we, we can improve, for example, caching capabilities or prefetching capabilities or security capabilities or safety capabilities of the architecture? And Ottawa and Constantinos and others designed an FPGA-based infrastructure to do that. Am I correct? Sure. Okay. I got the best paper award, by the way. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? I'm giving you a broad overview. I mean, clearly there are a lot of papers that are uh, associated with these. But this is something that we're looking at. I think at least some of the key principles can be summarized this way. We want to be more data-centric. Uh, and I think one had a slide on what it means to be data centric, processing near data processing as much as possible, uh, having low lat latency, low energy access to data, uh, making data storage as cheap as possible, but reliable also, having intelligent controllers, ensuring that uh, data doesn't get corrupted. Those are all data centric. Data driven means that you basically design architectures to make intelligent decisions based on data, as opposed to human driven. Uh, so a lot of architecture design and system design so far has been human driven, right? Humans basically, okay, I design a cache. These are the characteristics that I want to add into the cache. These are the heuristics I add. Of course, humans use data to simulate what happens, but once you design the controller, it operates using some heuristics. The controller doesn't improve its policy based on its experience, right? This is very different from how, a, how an intelligence system operates, whereas data driven means you evaluate your policy as you get data and change your actions based on that, right? As humans, we do that, right? As humans are actually very data-driven uh, beings, let's say. Uh, when I, I mean, very simple things like touching a stove, right? If you're a kid, you touch a stove, you do it once, and if it was hot, you don't do it again. You quickly learn based on data. You're not hardwired with the heuristics that says, touch the stove no matter what, right? But today we're hardwiring our machines with heuristics that are human driven. So we, we want to break free out of those heuristics essentially uh, so that we can actually make the architectures better over time. And data where I just talked about basically can we express the properties of the data. And actually this is not just about the data also interestingly uh, because uh, you don't want to express just the properties of data if you're thinking for this direction. You also want to express the properties of computation in my opinion. How, how critical is this piece of computation and maybe data associated with it uh, for uh, security, for example. You want to encapsulate these uh, things that you want to compute uh, so that, uh, with the different characteristics. So how, 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 how approximable is this computation? Again, uh, everything I said kind of applies to that, right? Should you keep this computation private, let's say? So if you express these properties, you can design systems that can actually uh, more, more fundamentally uh, provide security guarantees, for example. 
as I said earlier. If this data needs to be secure, maybe execute it in isolation alone and don't execute anything else at the same time. There's a heavy handed solution, of course, but that's one way of getting rid of these side channels. Okay. Yeah, so basically, I'm very interested in principles. And these are some of the principles that we have, uh, especially in this uh, data centric, data aware and data driven parts, basically. You know, I don't know if I want to go over these. <laughs> I mean, we work a lot with industry also, actually. I, industry, uh, we talk, we get input in terms of what problems they have. Uh, we don't necessarily do the research that they think is interesting because sometimes they think very short term, but longer term is more important. Their short term problems are not that interesting, but their longer term problems are very interesting, right? Uh, so for example, in processing in memory, uh, it's been a long road, right? Uh, uh, as we have seen in the earlier memory centric computing. Uh, so, it takes time to open people's minds to some disruptive ideas, I would say. Uh, that was also Rohammer, like I mentioned last time. Uh, Rohammer, we did a lot of work, and finally, industry is writing papers about it in 2023. We started doing work in 2012. Our first paper was rejected in 2013 from Micro. So it would have been 10 years, actually, if it weren't rejected, but it got published in ISCA in 2014, and industry finally writes a paper about it in 2023. So you can see the timeline, right? There's a long timeline uh, to uh, actually get the industry moving. Uh, I mean, industry, of course, didn't stay silent. They actually implemented a lot of the solutions, uh, some of which were proposed by ours, uh, by, by us in, inside their systems, but they were not fully secure, as you remember from last lecture. Right? So, so there's a lot of impact to be had, I think, uh, uh, by understanding the industry's problems and uh, solving them in a longer term manner. You don't want to tweak the transistors to solve the short term manner, right? You don't want to be designing products for industry. <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're doing research, of course, if your goal is to design products for industry, then you should be doing products for industry. But that's not research in my opinion. Uh, unless there's an application. So applications change the thing, basically. If, if, if there's an application that's new, and if, uh, if that can, if that requires a system design uh, that's not done before, and but it requires some understanding of the full system uh, so that you can actually improve uh, an application significantly. That's where I think uh, research, that's, that's still research in my opinion. Okay, so this is one paper that we're not gonna cover, but that talks about a lot of these principles uh, more recently. Any questions? I'm staying at high level, but I'm gonna give you a low level thing soon. <laughs> I'm going to actually go from the side level to a very low level, like doing that. Okay, but before I do that, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, Mohammed introduced the group, and we had some people in the group earlier in the first uh, lecture over here. But this is my group. There are quite a few people right now. Uh, we we actually have these uh, newsletters, as you can see. This is pre-COVID. Uh, this is during COVID. This is I wouldn't call it after COVID, but <laughs> sometime around COVID again, December 2021. But we have newsletters. If you're interested, you can take a look at these newsletters for some uh, interesting updates uh, during the time frame of the newsletter. So we're going to release another one, actually. I keep promising it for three months. We have one, but it's just, just, it's just not released publicly. So it's microarchitectural right now. It's not exposed to the world. <laughs> but it's going to be released soon. It's going to cover basically whatever happened since December 2021. And have another picture. So, uh, how many people are interested in pursuing a PhD here? If you're not already doing that, <laughs> how many people are already doing it? Okay, of course, there are two people here who are shy. Joel is less shy. <laughs> okay, you're not interested? You don't know yet. Okay, even if you're not interested, it's good to know what PhDs do. Uh, these are my PhD students plus postdocs. It's not complete, I think, because I was adding stuff today. Well, PhD students are complete. I think postdocs are not complete. Uh, but you can also look at their theses. All of the theses are available online. Uh, OK. Yeah, I mean, you. Uh, some, uh, I think Mohammed covered some of these, so I will go through these relatively quickly. So if you, you're taking this course, Seminar in Computer Architecture, some of you probably took the Computer Architecture and this, uh, the, the DDCA course, basically. And these links are old, as you can see. There's a Spring 2023 edition that's going on right now. Uh, but if you're interested, if you're really interested in computer architecture, you may have taken this course, or or you may not have taken it. I would recommend taking it. 
We're going to teach it in, uh, this happens in every fall semester. And if you have not taken DDCA, and I know that some people have not taken DDCA because there are different streams of students coming into the seminar, uh, I would recommend looking into the DDCA course because it gives a full introduction uh, to, let's say, digital design and computer architecture. Okay, there are other courses and you can find them online. Uh, these are some, again, not up to date links, but I mean, any edition is good, let's say. I keep, I keep, I change the course every semester in different ways. Uh, so uh, the fall 2022 version is not the same and fall 23 version is not going to be exactly the same. Okay, seminar is what you're taking right now. So we also have a processing in memory course. This is the first processing in memory course that I know of that anybody has started. Of course, anybody can correct me on that. Uh, so we actually uh, have a lot of interesting things over here. If you're interested in processing in memory, for example, uh, we have a genomics course that Mohammed mentioned. I think Mohammed mentioned all of these, but genomics courses specifically focused on genomics. Uh, heterogeneous system course that Juan is leading. Uh, so these are courses that you can take online, basically. You don't need to register or get credit. Uh, you can actually find them online. A lot of people do that and send us emails. <laughs> But I would recommend people who are interested in it to look at it because these cover some cutting edge topics, for example, on GPUs and also some FPGAs. A lot of the focus is on GPUs, uh, but there are some FPGAs and other heterogeneous systems as well. Hardware software co-design. Uh, this is more, let's say, a course that's being developed over time. There's solid state drives that Mohammed and Rakesh are leading. Do I hear myself? Is everything okay on Zoom? Are people still awake on Zoom or are they bored? No, no, it's it's all good. Okay, good. <laughs> Can you see me when I speak on Zoom? Or am I far away from the cameras? If if you're all the way to the left, you're out of the picture, but normally oh, okay. it's okay. Can we you know, can we move that while we're doing this? Because I like staying here. I'm still not used to this. During COVID, uh, I was presenting from my computer most of the time. So you don't need this, right? You just keep clicking. <laughs> so you can see that. Uh, that's another example of data-driven human beings, right? <laughs> I, I received a lot of input <laughs> data that uh, changed how I actually interact with the computer also <laughs> because of some environmental thing that's going on outside. Right? So we have solid state drive scores. Actually, this is important. We should really rename this to the more storage system scores, I would say. Uh, and I think this is actually going to be even more important going into the future. Uh, like we talk a lot about memory and memory is very important clearly, but storage is actually perhaps even more important than many applications going into the future because memory is of limited size. Where storage can store a lot more, right? There's a lot more possibility to manipulate data and be more efficient. Uh, and also storage is here, memory is here. If you want to do a memory processing, either you get rid of storage and bring everything into the memory directly or you move, the, move stuff from storage and memory. And that actually is very inefficient. Moving data from storage to memory is actually quite inefficient uh, today in terms of both performance and energy. So going into the future, uh, storage is going to be even more important in my opinion. Uh, yeah, these are things that people uh, don't talk about in general, but if you look down maybe 20 years down the road, I will bet that storage is going to be important. Maybe we will, we will think more about uh, storage as a computing device uh, as opposed to memory or processors. Okay, and then we have specialized courses on DRAM exploration, ProHammer also, uh, and RAM later. This is more of the simulation aspects. Okay, any questions? These are courses. I mean, I talk about courses because courses actually are feeding the research also. I'll have a slide on that uh, soon. Uh, yeah, I think you may have seen. If, if you're interested in knowing more, there's more uh, detail over here, especially on what it is like to be a, uh, be a PhD student, do research in these areas. I have a, uh, I have this talk that they invited me to do at the architecture mentoring workshop, undergraduate work mentoring workshop, a couple of years ago at the major architectural conference. And you can take a look at it. I don't have time to do that. I mean, I could do it, but I have other things in mind in the agenda for today. Okay, there's also more, if you wanna know, know, learn more about what we do and uh, some things interesting. Yeah, this is why we focus on courses, because I think this is an endless loop, if you will, because uh, in the end, research and teaching are very similar, in my opinion, uh, at least in the end result, right? You do research. Why do you do research? You do research to educate 
the community. Where do you educate the community? Community, scientific community, and hopefully at some point the broader community. You educate the community. What what uh, what do you educate the community on? Basically, it's something that no one has known. That's the research. No one has done it. You did it, and you educate the community. You do some teaching to basically tell what you found out. Right? Teaching is essentially the same thing, except you tell people what everybody could know. So that's the let's say minor but critical difference between research and teaching. And these two things are actually really important because they feed each other in the end. What was researched 10 years ago becomes teaching after it's known. Right? So a lot of the things that we discussed uh, in this course are kind of education, right? You're not doing research, but you're just studying what someone else did. Okay, so that's why I think it really, it's really important to have uh, research in, in even the beginning courses at a university. Otherwise, I mean, I think uh, the university environment does both in the end, right? Uh, your, uh, my goal as a professor is to do research, education, and service in the end. And, uh, but if in, in the education, if research is missing, there's something missing that the students don't get exposed to uh, if, that, if, 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 if we do that. That's why I think research is very important to inject into the teaching as well. Because that enables those students to get the sparks that I mentioned earlier, right? If you actually, I, I, I actually injected the ideas early, oh, so you can actually do things differently. People are working on this research and you can think about it maybe. That can enable a spark. I don't know when, maybe two minutes later, maybe two hours later, maybe two days later, two years, maybe two lifetimes later, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's what happens. Okay, so you can see more talks also. I mean, you probably have seen uh, our open source uh, stuff. I'm not going to harp on that. Actually, this is what I wanted to mention. This is an old slide. But we uh, do these Safari live seminars. Well, right now they're hybrid. We started during COVID. That's why it's live. But we have these uh, computing related seminars that we host. Uh, and there will be some seminars this semester also. Uh, so we will invite you to those as well. If you're interested in the topic, you can attend, ask questions, etc. Does that sound good? I believe there are three that are scheduled or being scheduled right now for this semester. And again, there are a lot of interesting things that, for example, in memory processing is actually a huge area uh, today. Uh, and we had a special session uh, last year uh, in this symposium uh, that essentially covered a lot of aspects of in-memory processing. If you're interested in this stuff, basically, you can find a lot of information uh, on our website and channel, et cetera. Again, I don't have time to go over this. Uh, different people talked about different things over here. So open source, I think we believe a lot in open source. I think this is really important for progress in general. Uh, as much as possible, we try to open source things. Uh, I will give a story about that later on when I go into the more depth, let's say. And you can find a lot of these open source artifacts online on our GitHub. Uh, so a lot of these tools actually are being used by academia and industries or emulators, one example. It's a state-of-the-art simulation system for uh, memory systems. And we're going to release a new version of it also. So it's actually it, uh, being used by industry and academia. So we actually receive a lot of feedback privately from industry as to what to put, what to improve. Uh, and it's all good, constructive. Uh, it's open source, basically. It has, it's, it's released under the MIT, which is the most free license uh, that you can find today. So this enables a lot of, I think, uh, uh, let's say, uh, research and development happening across the world as well. So we, uh, this is another example. I think Juan mentioned this. this these are crossing in memory benchmarks for the OpMap system. It's being used by a lot of people also right now. This is the SSD simulator that we developed, MQSIM. And you know about Rohammer. This was the code that we released when we wrote the paper. Uh, and then Google actually used this code to release their own code. So there's a Google thing as well. And then there are a bunch of other things. SoftMC we talked about also actually when we talked about Rohammer, right? This is the DRM infrastructure that we built. It was built in 2011, but we released in 2017. So you can see that we don't necessarily release things right away. And there's a good reason for that. I will discuss that later on. So there's six year. And actually a new version of it, Atabark is uh, responsible for it he is the it's also online it's also online yes <laughs> and it's uh, yeah the paper is also online you're probably going to update the archive paper also so yeah yeah basically uh these things evolve also and people use it uh, so softmc for example enabled a lot of research on 
figuring out how DRAM operates uh, by us as well as many others uh, in the field. Okay, so there's more. So we do a lot of open sourcing basically, including the lectures and uh, yeah, and courses, everything in the courses. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, I think that those of those tools have been used a lot using uh, A or C or C++ as a programming language. Yeah. Um, are there actually many factors that affected this decision um, other than like the Borman and the Russian popular architectures? Yeah, that's a good question, basically. I mean, not all of them, but most of them are C or C++. You're right, at least the ones that go over here. Uh, well, I think performance is one of the major reasons, right? Because you, if you want to write a simulator, uh, you really want it to be high performance. And it's very hard to get high performance with much higher level languages today, like Python, Java. Actually, the first version of Ramlator that I wrote uh, together with my colleague at Microsoft Research, this is circa 2007, 2006, actually, not so, it was C sharp. Why? Because Microsoft, you can use C sharp and you have a lot of tools, right? Uh, so it was a little higher level, and yet C sharp is uh, a higher level language. A lot of things are similar to C, of course, but much uh, still higher level. Uh, so we wrote it in C sharp, and we never translated into C or C plus plus until I gave that, gave that simulator to my students at Carnegie Mellon, and they said, "Okay." Actually, initially we were using C sharp also, but then it, it became very cumbersome to continue with C sharp. It was slow. Uh, the compatibility with other tools. We're, we're not that good also. Uh, so we decided to switch to C and C++. So there is a version of, I believe there's a version of RAM later that's C-sharp that's also released. Not as popular as this one. Yeah. But I think it depends in the end. So there, uh, for example, I think in DRAM vendor, there's a lot of Python also, right? Yes. In this current release. Yeah. This For the what version? Yeah. It's an actual along the C++ API. Yeah, exactly. So you could actually program it using Python also if you want simplicity. And R as the languages that they also use a lot of at times. Could you say again? Like R assembler languages that still be used to lots of times. I mean, I wouldn't say assembly. Uh, I don't see a lot of benefit to assembly, but uh, I mean, certainly lower level things like hardware description language, very long. SoftMC has a lot of very long code, right? Because that's what we program the FPGA with. But yeah, we don't do a lot of assembly, I would say. Okay, are you going to correct me or? No, that's not yeah. much great. Yeah, there's not much great. Rohammer, where you could find some. That's true, yeah. Ro yeah. I mean, Rohammer, yeah, that has some assembly, but because we demonstrated uh, using that assembly code that I showed you last week. Yeah, but it's mainly for demonstration purposes, not to, because it's very cumbersome to program a huge simulator assembly. They could do a lot of things in C. I mean, C has ways of actually incorporating assembly into it. If you really want something to be performance critical, you can actually call some assembly commands in C. That's how low level it is. Look, any other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, so this this is a very quick overview. <laughs> I'm not going to talk much, basically. So these are some key problems that I see, I think, uh, that we're having going into the future. Sustainability being a very important one. This we've talked about. Workloads are becoming more demanding. And there are new device technologies that are happening. So if you've taken DDCA, I talk about this as uh, there's a lot of opportunity at the top, uh, meaning top of the software stack, workloads, algorithms, et cetera, architectures. And there's a lot of opportunity at the bottom also, new technologies and how to enable them. I don't have the slides right now. I could probably find them. but I'm not going to do that right now. But these are some directions that are actually feeding into our research. Just to give you a little bit more insight, uh, I mean, our group is relatively big. It's more than 40 people. But that for, those 40 people include PhD students, postdocs, master's students, bachelor's thesis students, uh, semesters, semester project students, and also interns that we take from all over the world. So it's a big group. Uh, and there's a lot going on. It's very hard to summarize everything in a single uh, presentation. But these are this. I think this, what we do, uh, let's say weekly, gives an idea uh, of the kind of major research areas that are going on, right? For example, processing in memory has some meetings, should really have more meetings, I think. Uh, this AIML is a general topic on 
how do we accelerate machine learning? How do we make it more scalable, more robust? And also how do you use machine learning to design better architectures, data-driven, as we discussed? Storage, I mentioned that DRAM, I mentioned that. So a lot of the Rohammer research gets discussed in DRAM, but also other types of DRAM research gets discussed over there. There's bioinformatics, as you can see, and then there's an emerging technologies and applications meeting. Some of these actually overlap in terms of topics with, with different meetings or so different, uh, and anybody can attend any of the meetings. And some people attend multiple of these meetings, which is a good thing, because you get exposed to a lot of different ideas. So these are these are research meetings as well as brainstorming meetings. People discuss papers, ideas. Sometimes it's actually very similar to what we're going to do in this course. Somebody presents a paper, and there's a lot of discussion on that paper, and people brainstorm ideas. To actually, oh, can you do this? Or maybe there's something wrong in this paper, and uh, we could do better, or something like that, right? And then there's a. a and these topics evolve also. If I showed you this picture, let's say five years ago, the names would be very different. If I showed you this picture 10 years ago, the names would be very different. Uh, I'm sure I can dig up my records and slides to figure those out, but I'm not sure if it's going to be the most useful use of my time to do so. Uh, yeah, there's a meeting on hardware, software, co-design and security in general, because these things are very closely related as, we, as I just told you about the Metasys paper that Otterberg presented, right? That paper basically shows that uh, by expressing things better uh, in the hardware software interface, you can do better memory safe uh, in, on real FPGA uh, prototypes. And we have a reading group, which is actually some kind of similar to this, except you normally cover multiple papers. Uh, that's where every uh, all group members attend. And then we have a general group meeting uh, that's usually on administrative issues, but sometimes on research also. So you can see now how some more insight into what's, what may go on in a research group, right? Uh, there's also meetings with industry. Some of them are regular, some of them are on demand. These are less frequent, of course. These are more to either get feedback from industry or this is what we have done, what do you think? Uh, can you use it for something? Uh, or uh, to uh, get ideas from industry in the sense that uh, what are the interesting problems that you may uh, it may be useful uh, to potentially look at. Okay, and we get a lot of funding also. We should get more funding. But just, <laughs> I know you guys are not from industry, but uh, it's really important, I think. If for, yeah, I think uh, this is something that's going to be important for future in, in the world, I think. How do you get the funding to do fundamental research? I see this being threatened uh, by let's say a lot of politics, <laughs> I should say it that way probably. But basically fundamental research is, the, the amount of funding that goes into truly fundamental research is reducing in the world. Uh, but we need fundamental research, right? Not everything can be application oriented. There's a huge hype today, clearly on machine learning that you may know, chat GPT, et cetera, but not everything in the world is that. Right? There's a lot of fundamental things that we really need to develop for other things. Like extremely efficient computing, right? How do you make things more sustainable? Uh, I mean, how do you design power systems that are going to sustain things much more efficiently, right? These are fundamental, but they may, they may not be as flashy as chat GPT. So there's a huge uh, danger I see that the uh, world is moving towards us. Oh, okay, let's do, the, let's do the flashy thing and ignore all of the areas. I'm much of a believer in fundamental things and more. Uh, let's say, uh, more reasonable distribution of resources for research. <laughs> 10 years down the road, if no one is able to design that, uh, I don't know, transformer, what are you going to do? Chat GPT is not going to help you probably. Well, you can say, okay, robots are going to design it. Are you going to trust them? That's, I think that makes my point. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay, that finishes the introduction. Any questions? I hear myself from here. Okay. So, okay, the next thing I planned was, well, I didn't really plan it, but let me stop sharing. Okay, now I see myself also. That's not terrible. Uh, okay. Do you want to take a break or should we continue? Tradition has been no break in this course, but which is not good. Who wants to take a break, short break? Five minutes, somewhat.
Let's take a five minute break and then we'll be back. Yeah, just stretch or something. We can be back at 5.15. I want to organize my slides a lot. <laughs> which way is this? This time. And Ich 
Das ist ja nicht möglich, das ist das Sinn von Strukturstoff. Das ist so, Okay, let's get started. As I said, I'm going to go low level, uh, building on what we did last time. Uh, but the reason I want to talk about this is actually to emphasize something else, which is the importance of building infrastructure and in research. So research actually, uh, research takes time, as I said, right? The impact takes time. Sometimes it happens after your lifetime and you never know about it. Uh, if it happens earlier, that's good, of course. So you can see your ideas uh, uh, getting some uh, impact in real systems, right? But doing research itself also takes time, right? If you, if you remember this picture that I showed you uh, from the Rohammer lecture, lecture last time, we built this infrastructure. And this particular picture is actually from the infrastructure from 2011 that we built. And the goal was to actually study the retention areas. I'm going to talk about retention uh, today. And this infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, Montavar just recently released a paper on the updated version of this infrastructure. Uh, and we built this infrastructure in 2011 and open sourced in 2017. And our goal was to study something called data retention, as I mentioned last time. And I'm going to talk about that because it's very fundamental and interesting. Uh, and you can see this an updated version of the infrastructure in 2014. You cannot see the bottom of the slide for some reason. Are you sure there is no way of get rid of that? Can you try and double develop? Can I try double? <laughs> anyway, you can try while I'm talking. So it's a terrible interface, right? Zoom interface. But people will be able to see it. Oh, maybe not. Oh, that's fine. I think. No, no. You and worse. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can go back. Maybe you go to full screen. Maybe that was not full screen. This was full screen. Why do they have that stuff in the full screen? Hide. It's help. Well, we don't see ourselves. Yeah, that doesn't work. I didn't. Okay, anyway, maybe there is no easy way. I guess on uh, on live stream you're okay. It's just this yeah. this picture, this whatever is uh, gets projected over here. Okay, so this is where we did a lot of Roham experiments, and this is when we released it. We made it actually much easier to use. This is part of Hassan's thesis, a PhD thesis. It's flexible, it's easy to use. It's even more easier to use right now with the Mender because it's Python API, right? Uh, and open source. And this has enabled a lot of studies. Uh, like Rohammer studies that we discussed, right? Some studies that were previously not possible uh, to do. But the reason we built it is because of this. What does this look like? I keep seeing these all over the right. This is a leaky DM cell. No. Oh, here my George. That's a real <laughs> demonstration of leakage, I would say. It's a waste, right? Where does that water go? I actually recently taken another one that I can find on my phone. <laughs> it's, it's all over the place. It's such a big waste, in my opinion. Like, look at that.
like I tend to, okay, I tend to uh, notice these things and see how much waste we're, uh, how much waste there is in the design of, in general, the macro things uh, around us. We do try to optimize a lot in the micro level, but there's a lot of waste we eliminate also. But this is the kind of waste we're trying to eliminate, basically. Oh, I don't know what happened. It's moving again. So uh, I mentioned this paper last time. We wrote this paper. How many people know about this paper? Okay, some people do, probably. It's fine. Uh, how do you know about it? Probably the lecture. No, from the, the, the course. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually cover this more oh, in computer architecture. Yes, definitely. We cover it a lot more in the computer architecture. So some of this is going to be boring for you because you've seen it earlier. If you're taking computer architecture. I mentioned this also in digital design and computer architecture, but we don't go into all the detail. But we basically wanted to eliminate the refresh. That was our goal as much as possible. And this is the paper that, and basically we propose some ideas over here. I'm going to actually mention them. And then we, uh, these ideas were in simulation, and uh, we believe that these ideas are good, actually. Uh, and then we wrote this paper saying that actually you can get rid of a lot of refresh. Uh, I'm going to mention this briefly. And then uh, the question is, can you actually really make it happen? So that's the reason why we built this infrastructure. Can we get rid of refresh? And we've been building this infrastructure since 2011. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm going to talk about this paper. In fact, I'm going to give a presentation of the paper that I gave in ESCA 2013, 10 years ago. Uh, my student could have presented, uh, but I present it, and hopefully it'll be interesting. It's this paper. Uh, so let's talk about it. Does that sound good? It's like a real conference presentation, of course, in a different setting. I'd be talking, let's say, much more methodically in the ISCA conference talk. Okay, so DRM refresh, for example, I could have used that example if I had that picture in the talk, but I didn't have that picture at that time. So DRM cell, you've seen this also last a uh, week consists of a capacitor and an access transistor. It stores data in terms of charge in the capacitor. And essentially, this charge leaks. And a DRM check consists of tens of uh, tens of hundreds, tens of thousands of such rows of cells. So it's big, basically. And it's becoming bigger. And the problem is the DRM capacitor charge leaks over time. As a result, each uh, DRM row is periodically refreshed to restore the charge. This is called a refresh. In other words, you activate each row every n milliseconds, and typical n at the time was 64 milliseconds. Today we're at 32 milliseconds and lower at higher temperatures. So there are many downsides to refresh. It consumes energy. Uh, each refresh consumes energy. Uh, performs, this is kind of the waste of water we've seen, right? We're wasting energy. Uh, and DRM rank or bank are unavailable while the chip is being refreshed. There is a quality of service impact. Uh, you get pause time during refresh. and Refresh rate actually limits the DRM capacity scale. So this is what we argued in the earlier paper in 2012. I'm going to use those slides. I borrowed those slides from that paper. You cannot see it referenced at the bottom. Really annoying. Thanks, Zoom. <laughs> so the paper is referenced at the bottom behind that Zoom thing. Uh, so basically, this shows that as you increase the capacity of the DRM device, the percentage of time you spend refreshing increases based on some modeling and expectation, of course, right? So why does this happen? Because there are two reasons. First, in a device that is higher capacity, you have more rows. So you have more rows to refresh. And second, uh, as you go to higher capacity, cells become leakier because cells become smaller. So there's a lot of noise in the cells. As a result, you need to refresh every cell more frequently. Because of this double effect, uh, the amount of time you spend refreshing a 64 gigabit DRAM chip is, that's what we, suggested is about, let's say, 46% of the time. You can think of this as throughput loss of the DRAM chip. 46% of the throughput of the DRAM chip is gone. You just need to refresh. You can, you can also uh, think about it as the water that you cannot use in that uh, thing that I showed you earlier, right? The fire hydrant. You have a solution? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. And the energy is very similar, basically. As device capacity increases, and you can see the present, uh, we had eight gigabit capacity device. Today we have 16 gigabit capacity devices, maybe 24 also. Uh, no. uh, but basically we're marching towards the, uh, from the left to the right. And uh, we expected that the energy spent on accessing uh, DRAM will mostly be spent on a refresh. Yeah, this is a percentage DRAM energy spent refresh with some uh, access probability, et cetera. So this depends on how frequently access the app. So for example, as I said last time, the, the thing in my pocket is refreshing its memory right now. It's wasting energy. I'm not accessing it. 
If I'm accessing it, clearly that fraction would be lower because uh, this is a fraction of the total DRAM energy that's spent. Okay, but uh, we motivate this is an important problem. And there's work uh, that observed that there's significant variation in the data retention time of DRAM cells due to manufacturing process variation. And retention time is defined as the maximum time a cell can go without being refreshed while maintaining its stored data. And these prior works propose methods to take advantage of widely varying retention times among DRM rows. So for example, the work that we presented at ISCA the previous year to this paper reduces the refresh rate for rows that can retain data for longer than 64 milliseconds. And you can actually, assuming that you can identify that. Uh, there's earlier work actually that shows uh, that disables rope that have uh, low retention times. That was in 2006, as you can see. And there's a bunch of other work that we referenced in the paper. And these works all show large benefits in energy and performance. So uh, let me describe the work that we did last year. Well, when I was presenting, it was last year. Now it's 11 years ago. So basically, Raider retention of our intelligent DRM refresh consists of three steps. You first profile the retention drive of all DRM rows. And then you store the rows into bins by retention time in the memory controller. Basically, you categorize the retention types. And we use Bloom filters for efficient and scalable storage. So basically, you categorize retention time over the entire DRAM like this. And the distribution looks like this. And you store the addresses of rows that need to be refreshed frequently into Bloom filters, which provides scalable and efficient storage. And we showed in the earlier paper that you need only 1.25 kilobyte storage in the memory controller for a 32 gigabyte DRM memory. So it could be very efficient, basically. And then the memory controller uses this information, the Bloom filters, to refresh rows in different bins at different rates. So that's the promise. And this work showed that you can reduce refreshes by 75%. Uh, and this reduces energy consumption and improves performance, as shown by that work and other works also. Makes sense, right? OK, so the problem is. Uh, this work and all of the other works require accurate profiling of DRM row retention times. So that's what we're targeting in this work. Uh, to maintain data integrity while reducing refreshes, we need to have an accurate and reliable measurement of retention time of every single DRM row. And the assumption is that worst case retention time of each row can be determined and stays the same at a given temperature. That's what these previous works assumed. For example, some works both of the works that I mentioned from 2006 and 2012 propose writing all ones and zeros to a row and measuring the time before data gets corrupted. That's your retention time. Right? Now, the question, of course, the scientific question is can we actually do this? Can we reliably and accurately determine retention times of all DRM rows? And that's what this paper is all about. So, there are two challenges that make this difficult. And one is data pattern dependence, and the other is variable retention time. Let's take a look at these uh, one by one. Data pattern dependence uh, says that retention time of a DRM cell depends on its value and the values of the cells nearby it. Why? Because things are too close to each other and things are coupled. Let's take a look at that. Thing. So when, it, when you activate a row in DRM, all of the bit lines that are connected to that row are perturbed simultaneously. So let's take a look at this pictorially. So you have a row that's called a word line, another row over here. And these are the bit lines, and these are the cells hanging off of this word line, meaning the row. So if we activate that row, this blue thing over here, word line, the blue bit lines over here get perturbed simultaneously because what happens is uh, the capacitors over here get connected to the bit lines and all of those wires get perturbed. And there's electrical noise on the bit line. And this electrical noise affects the reliable sensing of a DRM cell along that row. And the magnitude of this noise is affected by the values of the nearby cells. Let's take a look at that. So there's bit line to bit line coupling. So if you're reading the cell over here, there's coupling that happens due to the perturbation that happens when you read simultaneously uh, the cells that are connected to the adjacent bit lines. And there's bit line to word line coupling. If you're reading the cell, there's electrical coupling between uh, the bit line and the word line that's activated. And this coupling actually affects uh, the retention time as well as the values you may read. Okay, so basically, uh, because of this coupling, uh, you affect uh, the data that's stored in other cells, and the retention time of a cell depends on data patterns stored in nearby cells. And if you really want to find the uh, worst case retention time of a cell, you need to find the worst data pattern uh, 
Otherwise, you may actually get some uh, retention time. That's not the worst case. And this is going to pose a challenge, as we will see. The second challenge is maybe even harder. Uh, we call this, the, well, this is called the variable retention time. And this is the phenomenon that retention time of the DRM cell changes randomly over time. A cell basically alternates between multiple different retention time states. And this is reported in literature as early as 1987. Uh, basically, the leakage current uh, of a cell, leakage current that goes from the capacitor to the transistor to the bit line, sporadically changes due to a trap in the gate oxide of the DRM cell access transistor. And this trap happens, and randomly this trap becomes occupied. And whenever this trap becomes occupied, charge leaks more readily from the transistor's drain, and that leads to a short retention time. Basically, you can think of this uh, with the picture I showed you, uh, that uh, fire hydrant once in a while dumps a lot of water. And this happens randomly. Okay, this is called trap assistance GIDL gate induced drain leakage. And uh, previous work in electron devices conferences showed that uh, this is a random process. Basically, the takeaway is that worst, worst case retention time of a cell depends on a random process. Can we easily determine the worst case given this fact? Okay, so our goal in this work is to basically understand these effects. To do so, we would like to analyze the retention time behavior of DRM cells in modern commodity DRM devices uh, so that we can aid the collection of accurate profile information. And we provide a comprehensive empirical investigation of two key challenges to retention time profiling, which I introduced, data pattern dependence and variable retention time. So this is what I will talk about next. Basically, we built an infrastructure to characterize DRAM. I'm going to talk about that and then provide some foundational results to validate that infrastructure. And then we're going to talk about the data pattern dependence and variable right retention time issues and talk about our conclusions, which basically will be there's more future work needed. So we developed this DGI3 DM testing platform uh, using Xilinx FPGAs. It's temperature controlled. We tested more than 200 commodity DM chips from five different manufacturers. And there are seven different families of chips uh, based on equal capacity per device. You can see we're going to look at these later on. Uh, and basically, uh, each experiment uh, consists of multiple rounds of tests. We do this round of tests to ensure statistical significance of the test, because one random test, you may get a result. But then if you do it many, many times, uh, those results average out, uh, or you can actually find outliers. Uh, and each test essentially searches for the set of cells uh, with a retention time that's less than a threshold value for a particular data pattern. This is a mouthful. Uh, so let's take a look at a high level structure. Basically, uh, we write uh, a data pattern to rows in a DRM bank. We prevent refresh for a period of time called T wait. We, we leave the DRM idle during that time. And then we read the stored data pattern, compare it to the written pattern, and record the corrupt cells as those with a retention time that are less than T wait. Basically, if some cells get corrupt after T wait idleness. We are going to assume that that's because of a retention error. Again, this is an assumption. This is one of the limitations of the study. This may not be due to our retention error. It may be another error mechanism, but we repeat this test many times. So there's some statistical significance to it. OK, so there's test details and important issues to pay attention to are discussed in the paper. You need to be careful, basically, how you design these experiments. So these are, this is an example experiment uh, structure. This is round one, round two. What we do is uh, we start uh, testing the bank, and then uh, you write the uh, data pattern X to the bank and wait for one and a half seconds. Uh, and this tests both the data pattern and its complement. And then, of course, read basically whatever we, I said, you read and check for corrupt cells. And then you do write data pattern Y and then data pattern Z. And then we do another data pattern X, but now we increment the waiting time to 1.6 seconds. So this way we go from 1.5 seconds to 6.0 seconds at some temperature, as we will discuss later. So that's considered a round. This way you collect for all data patterns and for all potential retention times, all the corrupt cells that you see. And then you repeat this experiment for statistical significance. So you can do thousands of rounds of testing. So uh, in our tests, most of our tests are conducted at 45 degrees Celsius. And we don't, have, we don't observe any cells to have retention time less than 1.5 seconds at 45 degrees Celsius. And we test T weight in increments of 128 milliseconds from 1.5 to 6.1 seconds. So this is a lot of tests, a lot of experiments, basically. Let's take a look at tested data patterns because it's going to be important for data pattern dependence demonstration. 
basically, as the previous work suggested, you can write all zeros and all ones to all of the bits. Previous work suggests that this is sufficient. But we also test checkerboard patterns, consecutive bits alternate between zero and one. And the reason we test is because this increases coupling noise, uh, because there's this, this causes more voltage difference between the neighboring bit lines. And it may induce worst case data pattern if adjacent bits are mapped to the adjacent sets. Now, that's not necessarily true, but this increases the probability that we test such, such things. So we also have a walk pattern, which attempts to ensure that a single cell storing one is surrounded by cell storing zero to maximize the coupling. Uh, this may lead to even worse coupling uh, due to coupling between nearby bit lines, as prior work also showed. And we permute the walk pattern in each round to exercise different cells. And the paper discusses that permutation. And then there's random testing. Basically, randomly generated data is written to each row in this case. And a new set of random data is generated for each round. Basically, this covers cases that we cannot cover with fixed patterns, clearly. So uh, these are fixed patterns. Walk is actually also not a fixed pattern, but it's a, it's a methodical change. Random is completely random. OK, so let's talk about how we validate this infrastructure. By the way, in hindsight, we should have shown the picture of the infrastructure in the talk. But hindsight is always 100%. Yeah, so uh, certainly we need to keep temperature stable. And we have a temperature, we have a, like, let's say, bare bones temperature controller for this. And basically, this shows our validation. And uh, over time, you see that there's some error margin in the temperature, but mostly we can keep it stable at different levels. And we can test chips at five different stable temperatures, as you can see. And then we also repeat some of the foundational results that prior work showed to validate uh, the goodness of our infrastructure, let's say. And this is a bit more involved. Basically, we analyze the dependence of retention time on temperature. And prior work reported very clearly there is a strong dependence of retention time on temperature. And our results actually uh, agree with prior work. Let's take a look at this, what we did. Basically, this temperature on the x-axis and normalized retention time on the y-axis. So this normalized retention time contains a fraction of cells that exhibited retention time failure at any T weight value for any data pattern at 50 degrees Celsius. So you can see that all cells are over here right now, right? Because that's normalized. Every cell should be there. Now, the next data points or data point distribution over here shows the normalized retention time of the same cells at 55 degrees Celsius. So you can see that the retention time is reducing and there's a distribution that's happening. Some cells are, let's say, some, for some cells, retention time is reducing less, for some cells, retention time is reducing more. And you repeat this until we get to 70 degrees Celsius. So we have normalized retention time of the same cells, the cells that were failing over here, same cells. How is the retention time distribution over here? Now, and then we basically, we have best fit exponential curves for the peak uh, and the tail. Peak meaning the uh, most populated part of the distribution, as you can see, this densest part of the distribution and the tail is the lowest possible retention time cells. And we fit these curves. And basically, uh, we validate our, uh, we see the same relationship previous work has seen, relationship between retention time and temperature is consistently bounded, predictable within a device. And every 10 degrees temperature increase leads to a 46.5% reduction in re retention time in the worst case. Okay, so we also do another validation, which is the retention time distribution over here. Our minimal tested retention time is 1.5 seconds at 45 degrees Celsius, which corresponds to about 126 milliseconds at 85 degrees Celsius. And this actually agrees with prior work. Today, at 85 degrees Celsius, uh, uh, the refresh rates are 32 milliseconds. So we actually, there's, we just show that there's some margin in the uh, retention times. And very few cells exhibit the lowest retention times. And the shape of the curve is consistent with prior works. Prior works have actually shown uh, this curve. And we also observe, unfortunately, you cannot see it, but newer device families have more weak cells than older ones. This is likely, likely a result of technology scaling at the bottom. <laughs> it's not seen in this, uh, whatever here, but it's seen over there. So this is likely a result of the technology scaling. So let's take a look at this space. So this is an older generation. You can see the retention time distribution looks like this. This is on the x-axis, on the y-axis, you see fraction of cells with a retention time that's less than the x-axis value. So if this fraction is higher, there are more cells that are failing at a given retention time, at a given x-axis value. So this is older. This is a newer generation from manufacturer D. You can see that more cells are failing in the newer generation at the given retention time. So this is a result of technology scaling, we believe. 
cells are smaller and there are more cells, more rows. So another one, uh, an older chip over here from manufacturer A, a newer chip from manufacturer A, you can see that the retention tires are becoming worse. More cells fail. Okay, so those were our foundational results to validate our infrastructure. Previous work has shown this. Now let's take a look at some new results. Uh, and we're going to look at data pattern dependence first. So let me set some terminology first. We're going to look at failure populations. Basically, a failure population of cells with retention time X. This refers to the set of all cells that exhibit retention failure in any test with any data pattern at that retention time. And that retention time is indicated as T weight. And then this is actually a failure population of all data patterns. But then we also want to analyze a specific data pattern. We define the term retention failure coverage of a data pattern DP. This is the fraction of cells with retention time X that exhibit retention failure with that particular data pattern, okay? Divided by the failure population that I defined earlier. So if retention times are not dependent on data patterns stored in the cells, we would expect coverage of any data pattern to be 100%. Basically any data pattern should be able to discover any cell that's failing, right? Basically if one data pattern causes a retention failure, any other data pattern should also cause a retention failure. So let's take a look at the, recall the tested data pattern. These are the data patterns that we're going to test. And I'm going to show you results with that. So basically, we don't see that. We basically see widely varying retention failure coverages for different data patterns. This is an example from manufacturer A's 2 gigabit chip family, 6.1 second retention time. Uh, that's what we test, basically, and 45 degrees Celsius, as I mentioned. And you can see the number of rounds over here. The fixed patterns, it doesn't matter what round you test. So the coverage is the same because you don't change the pattern with the rounds. Whereas uh, the uh, dynamic patterns, you can see the walk pattern and the random pattern, their coverage keeps increasing. Maybe there are some asymptotes, we don't know. But the rounds are, there are a lot, these are a lot of rounds actually. You said you test the chip after 16 rounds. So basically the takeaway here is that different data patterns have widely different coverage. Data pattern dependence exists and is severe. And coverage of fixed patterns is low. For example, if you tested all zeros and ones as prior work suggested, you get only 30% coverage of retention failures, which is not good. And walk is the most effective data pattern for this device, but you can see that even that is not 100% coverage after 16 rounds of testing, expensive testing based. And this is one device. No data pattern achieves 100% coverage rates. You cannot see that unfortunately, that's right under the uh, Zoom's beautiful interface. Yes. Can you figure out which, what, what 100% is? No, no. Okay, let's go back to the definition. <laughs> I defined it. So basically 100% is the failure population of cells with a retention time. It's the set of all cells that exhibit retention failure in any test with any data pattern for that given T weight. Basically, whatever we tested. <laughs> it's not the ground truth because there's something else probably that we didn't test that. If you want to really get the ground truth, you should test all possible data patterns, which is impossible to do in a lifetime. <laughs> That's a lot of data, right? a lot of combinations, right? We're talking about billions of cells in a chip. Okay, but that's a very good question. We define it. <laughs> okay, so uh, another chip from B this time, two gigabit chip family. Random is the most effective pattern for this device. So you cannot use the same pattern across devices. Random, again, it doesn't get to 100%, but it gets close. But you can see that other patterns are pretty bad, let's say. And another chip from C, manufacturer C here, random happens to be also better, but it doesn't get, it gets even worse than uh, close to 100%. Okay, so basically our uh, observations are similar across devices, across chips, across manufacturers. So we believe these are fundamental. So uh, basically a cell's, uh, let me, uh, let's summarize the observations. A cell's retention time is heavily influenced by data patterns stored in other cells that we have empirically shown. A pattern affects the coupling nodes, which affects cell leakage. And no tested data pattern exercise the worst case retention time for all cells. In other words, no pattern has 100% coverage. Uh, in other words, no pattern is able to induce the worst case coupling noise for every cell that we've seen. And we see one problem over here. And the problem is that underlying DRAM circuit organization is not known to the memory controller. In other words, from our perspective, as non-manufacturers of DRAM, it's very hard to construct a pattern that exercises the worst case cell leakage. So we believe that this is a fundamental problem. Uh, and also, there's another issue that exacerbates this, which is the opaque mapping of addresses to physical uh, DRM geometry. We don't know exactly which bit we write gets physically adjacent to which other bit, because there's some mapping, internal mapping that goes on, uh, and we don't know that. Later works actually reverse engineered a lot of that. But 
that's later than this work. So uh, the reason, uh, there, there's the re uh, first of all, the mapping is opaque, and there's also internal remapping that goes on internally in the DR chips to tolerate faults. And again, we don't know that. So what we think is adjacent may actually not be adjacent inside the chip. As a result, we may not be able to design a data pattern that has the best coupling. There are other issues that we don't discuss actually in this presentation, like true and anti-cells, but um, the paper discusses that. So basically, also one more thing that makes this difficult is uh, second order coupling effects are very hard to determine. The first order, maybe we can capture, assuming we kind of ignore the two, but then there are second order coupling effects uh, that happen in the circuits and those are very hard to determine. So we also see that fixed and simple data patterns have low coverage, as I've shown you. They do not exercise worst case coupling noise. Uh, and the effectiveness of each data pattern varies significantly between DRM devices of the same or different manners. Uh, so this indicates that the underlying DRAM circuit organization likely differs between different devices, which means that patterns leading to worst-case coupling are different in different devices, as I've also shown. So that's not so good. Basically, you cannot take one pattern and use it for every device. And we've also seen that technology scaling appears to increase the impact of data pattern dependence. And the reason is for this is scaling, meaning when you reduce the size of the circuit elements, capacitor, for example, you reduce the physical distance between the circuit elements, and this increased the magnitude of coupling events. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Actually, I have not shown you this one, but I will show you now. Uh, the, this is this, this, these two figures. Comparing these two figures show the effect of signal scaling as an example from, from an example from A, manufacturer A. So if you look at this chip family over here, the lowest coverage data pattern achieves much lower coverage for the smaller technology. So a checkerboard, for example, lower coverage, all zeros and ones, it achieves much lower coverage. Actually, all of the patterns that achieve lower coverage as you go from one technology node to another technology node. And we have similar examples in the paper for other manufacturers as well. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at the lowest coverage, checkerboard going, uh, is lowest here, all zeros and ones over here, you clearly have a jump. Okay, so basically what are the implications of this? We have a lot of results, more in the paper, and there are some implications that we draw. And the first implication is that if you, are trying to get rid of refreshes with some retention time profiling mechanism, you have to handle data pattern dependence of retention time. Intuitively, you can identify the data pattern that induces the worst case retention time for a particular cell or device. But there are two problems. One, it's very hard to know at the memory control which bits actually interfere with each other due to opaque mapping of addresses that I mentioned earlier. Logically consecutive bits may not be physically consecutive. And remapping of faulty bit lines and word lines to be done once internally with the DI makes exacerbates this problem. And the second problem is worst case coupling noise is affected by non-obvious second order bit line coupling effects uh, that are very hard to, uh, let's say, let's say reason about easily. So we suggest some avenues for future work. Uh, a mechanism for identifying worst case data patterns likely supports, likely requires support from the DRM device. And we believe DRM manufacturers might be in a better position to do this. However, the ability of the manufacturer to actually identify themselves and expose the entire retention time profile is limited by what I'm going to discuss next, which is variable retention time. So manufacturers are not in the best position for this. An alternative approach, uh, which could be more promising, is to use random data patterns to increase coverage as much as possible and handle incorrect retention time estimates with ECC. So if you somehow incorrectly identify a retention time, hopefully you'll have enough error correcting quotes. And these are relatively random errors as we have seen. So error correcting quotes could be a good option for this. But of course, to be able to do this, you need to keep profiling time in check because random data patterns, as I showed you earlier, it may take 16 or more rounds to get to even 90% coverage. For ECC to be productive, you need to actually do the calculations and you really need coverage more than 98% or so. Okay, so you need to keep ECC already in check also. So there's a trade-off over here between how much profiling you do and how much error correcting codes you use. So. Actually, this was a slide that was on target. Let's say there's a lot of work that happened after this that looked at profiling versus ECC overheads, including cell bar. Okay, so in hindsight, you can see actually how things evolve. Right? Let's talk about the second effect, which is variable retention time. We're going to do some analysis on this. So remember that this was a phenomenon that retention time of a cell can vary over time. And uh, remember that because a cell can randomly switch between multiple leakage current states due to trap-assisted gate-induced drain leakage which appears to be a random process. And these, this was first discovered in 1987 in this paper by Yanni. 
Uh, and Russell actually has a lot of interesting data on it. And you can see that these are IEDM electron devices meeting papers. Uh, okay, so this is an example of a VRT cell we actually observe in our system that we test. This is a cell from manufacturer E's two gigabit chip family. You can see that y x-axis is time and y axis is the retention time of the cell. Maximum retention time we test 6.1, minimum is supposed to be 1.5, let's say. But you can see that the cell's retention time is not constant. In many cases, maximum time, uh, basically the cell retains data for 6.1 seconds, but there are many cases also where you have a dip in the retention time. So that shows that there's some variable retention time effect that's happening. So we want to answer multiple key questions. First, how prevalent is variable retention time in, in modern DM devices? What is the time scale of observation of the lowest retention time state? Basically, how long do we need to test to get to the lowest retention time state? And can we be sure about it? Can we be sure that we're actually getting to the lowest retention time state? What are the implications of retention time profile? So for this, we test each device for at least 1,024 rounds over 24 hours, many rounds right now. Temperature is fixed at 45 degrees Celsius. And data pattern used is the most effective data pattern that we discovered for each device in the prior testing for data pattern. And for each cell that fails at any retention time, we record the minimum and the maximum retention time that we observe. So let's take a look at that it's summarized for a particular chip family from manufacturer A. So on the x-axis, we see the minimum retention time. On the y-axis, we see the maximum retention time. Uh, and th this is the population of cells uh, that uh, uh, basically we plot the density, the population of the cells uh, that uh, are fall into a particular xy point, minimum and maximum retention time. And if the minimum retention time of a cell is the same as the maximum retention time cell, uh, well, if there's no variable retention time, we would expect every single failing cell to fall into this line, x equals y line, because minimum retention time should be the same as maximum retention time. But we see almost exactly the opposite. Most cells you can see are over here. This population density is higher over here. And most cells are actually over here. So basically, most failing cells, most cells where we observe retention time failures exhibit variable retention time. Their minimum retention time varies widely compared to the maximum retention time. And you can see that there are many failing cells that jump from very high retention time, which is 6.1, to very low, which is 1.5. This is 45 degrees Celsius. So, uh, so basically, variable retention time phenomenon is real. This is B's uh, two gigabyte, gigabyte chip family, same thing. C is a very similar thing. So you see some very similar pictures for all manufacturers. So let's take a look at our observations so far. So variable retention time is common among weak cells, meaning those cells that experience low retention times. And variable retention time can result in significant retention time changes as we have seen. The difference between minimum maximum retention times of a cell can be more than four X and may not be bounded because we cannot do infinite amount of testing. So we don't know in the end, but we, we observe four X. And the implication is that finding a retention time for a cell and using a guard band to ensure minimum retention time is covered requires a very large guard band or may not work. I mean, if you interpret this in a different way, you set the retention time of a cell uh, and uh, you basically add some guard band saying that this is, uh, I actually protect for the worst case, but you may not know the worst case because you don't know the, what's the minimum retention time unless you do infinite testing. So basically, that's the problem. The retention time profile mechanism must identify the lowest retention time in the presence of this variable process, variable retention time. The question is, how long do you need to profile a cell to find the lowest retention time state? So we tried to answer this question also, meaning we basically wanted to see the time between retention time state chains. How much time does a cell spend in a high retention state before switching to the minimum observed retention time state? And this is real data from age 2 gigabit chip family. You can see the time spent in high retention state can be very large. And this is the relative frequency uh, of the amount of time that's spent uh, based on our rounds of testing. So for example, here, uh, the chip spends time in the high retention state for four hours before switching to the low retention time state. So you need to have, test the chip for four hours at least. But that's not enough, clearly, because there are cases where sometimes one day is spent on the high retention time state before the cell switches to the low retention time state. So the testing cost of really finding the lowest retention time of a cell, we believe is unbounded current. Okay, so I've already said this. No, I can see that one, that's good. So basically you need to profile for a long time to get to the minimum retention time state. Uh, and this is picture is very similar for different manufacturers. This is B, 
This is C. You can see very similar pictures as you can see. So what are the implications on profiling mechanisms? Basically, the first problem we see is that there is not, not seem to be a way of determining if a cell exhibits variable retention time without actually observing a cell exhibiting variable retention time. So this seems to be a true random process, and we don't know how to model it or predict it. The second problem is it's actually very difficult for the DM manufacturers to identify the retention time profiling. We cannot punt for the DM manufacturer in this particular case, like we did in the DM, uh, data pattern dependence. Because once you sold their DM chips uh, to a board, for example, you uh, either a DIM uh, or uh, directly to a board, if you do in the LPDDR, for example, you expose it to very high temperatures. And this can induce VRT in cells that were not previously susceptible. Basically, the VRT profile changes due to exposure to high temperatures due to soldering, for example, soldering. As a result, if manufacturer determined via, let's say, extensive testing for some, uh, with their knowledge of the circuit, which is also very hard, which we believe, their retention time profile may not be accurate. So one option for future work is very similar to what we have just discussed earlier for DPD. We believe you can use error correcting codes to continuously profile DM online while aggressively reducing refresh rate. And error correcting codes can handle the cases where you get a retention error uh, because uh, you, you thought that uh, your minimum retention time was actually higher. But of course, you need to keep ECC overhead in check if you want to do this. Okay, so that brings me to the end. So uh, to summarize, uh, DRM refresh is a critical challenge in scaling DRM technology efficiently to higher capacities and smaller feature sizes. And understanding the retention time of modern DRM devices can enable old or new methods to reduce the impact of refresh. And many mechanisms that were proposed and probably will be proposed in the future require accurate and reliable retention time profiles. We presented the first work that comprehensively examines the data retention behavior in modern commodity DRM devices. We characterized more than 200 devices from five different manufacturers. And our key findings show that retention time of a cell significantly depends on data patterns stored in other cells. We call this data pattern dependence and changes over time via random process variable retention time. We discussed the underlying reasons and provided suggestions. And we strongly believe that future research on retention time profiling should solve the challenges posed by the DPD, data pattern dependence and variable retention time phenomena. And that concludes the talk. Now, this was 10 years ago. <laughs> you can see that this was motivated by the idea over here. Can we do this? And this paper says, oh, maybe not. <laughs> At least not now. So it's, a, it's very important to do this in research, basically. Research moves on ideas, right? I think it was really important to write this paper to say, tell this idea that no one, let's say, thought about before. One option could have been, OK, we don't write this paper. Basically, we say, OK, we write the second paper. But I mean, there may be use cases for this idea that you may not think about also. Right? So there is actually uh, a tendency of when do you actually uh, decide when to expose research. Right? So we decided while even while we were doing these studies, we decided that it was important to expose this idea without any data from real chips uh, based on what uh, was discussed prior in research. And that had some contribution clear. But then of course, we want to make it real. So we actually designed this infrastructure and we uh, do the studies and Okay, maybe this idea is not that easy to implement. Then the question becomes, of course, how do you make it happen? And that's why later works came. This is some of our works. There are other people who actually also done works. This paper, for example, looks at how do you actually look at different techniques, error correcting goals, profiling, online profiling, etc. What are their effects uh, of on DRM retention pairs? This looks at variable retention times even more, for example. There's a lot more data over here. Again, this paper is not fully con conclusive as well. It's proposed online profiling. You see ECC in a little bit more, uh, but it doesn't provide a, a, a completely, let's say, uh, error proof or bulletproof methodology. But a lot of data, a lot of interesting data. This paper shows that you can actually uh, do what we suggested uh, in a more robust way. You can actually cover for variable retention time errors using error correcting codes by online profiling. I'm not going to talk about that. So this is a reasonably robust mechanism. And this paper looks at data defense failure. Basically, can we identify which bits are affecting which other ones uh, in the underlying e chips? What is the physical? So as I said in this talk in 2013, we don't know which cells are uh, uh, physically adjacent in the memory controller. This paper says, can we actually figure that out? 
And we figured that out mostly. And then there's more that I'm not going to talk about, but you can see that this work actually uh, is, keeps on moving forward. And I'm not talking about the, the rope hammer works. Okay, so I'm going to almost stop here soon, but basically you can more, learn more about this. I think you take, for those of you taking computer architecture, we've actually covered this in DRM refresh. Not the exact story, but we have a lecture on DRM refresh and data retention. But I will go back to the infrastructure. Basically enabling infrastructure is really important. It's enabled a lot of this research and a lot of other research in Rollhammer that I didn't discuss today, but we discussed last time. And you can see that we keep building the infrastructure. And I think it's really important to continue doing that. And this is the paper that I mentioned. Uh, this is the DR vendor infrastructure, which is a, essentially a DDR4 version of SoftMC, which has some other uh, interesting characteristics. So if you're interested, you can actually read it. Or if you're interested in doing research, you can contribute to it. It's also open source. You can find it online, so you can contribute to it even if you're not doing research. Okay, that brings me to the end. Wow, we're right at 18 zero zero. Any questions? Okay, let me take questions. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so the same problem that's seen from a different point of view is it possible, not by it, to optimize the side of the bicycles to reduce the retention time and extend the time? Yeah, I see retention time. Very hard. This is, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very optimized and it's very, very, very hard to control some of these effects because capacitor, uh, it's, it's not like a transistor, but even transistor, there's leakage effects that you cannot control. And especially as you reduce the size of the cell, there's a lot more noise that happens and it's very, very hard to control. Yeah. I mean, you can use classical redundancy techniques like store one bit in multiple cells, but that's very expensive. Yes. Potentially, if you can do it. So, I mean, certainly that's the promise of uh, these resistive memory technologies, right? Like phase change memory. They don't rely on charge to store data. I would say uh, it's really the, the retention time problems happen, especially in technology that rely on charge for data storage. Capacitor is an extreme case, but flash memory, for example, has retention time issues as well. Even though it doesn't rely on capacitor, it relies on a floating, a floating gate transistors, for example. But those things also cannot retain charge for very long, especially when you have written to sell uh, for many times. So retention type problems exist on charge-based memories, but with uh, yeah, resistance-based memories, for example, they don't exist as much. Uh, so yes, that's what we also proposed in some of the other <laughs> papers that we wrote in 2009, for example, why don't we use phase change memory to replace DRAM if you get rid of the refresh problem? But unfortunately, there are other issues in those technologies. And there are some retention time effects also. It's not as bad as in DRAM, at least in the technology nodes that we're looking at. So for example, phase change memory uh, has the resistance drift problem. The resistance kind of drifts from one value to a lower value. It's kind of like losing charge, but the resistance is drifting. Yeah. But the time scales are much larger than the uh, But yeah, that's the promise of some emerging memory technologies. They can get rid of some of the scaling issues that these existing memory technologies are facing. The downside is, like we first wrote the paper on that topic in 2009, but there was research going on on that topic even earlier. So it's been 20 years and the year I'm very strong. <laughs> so there's no technology that has unfortunately gotten close to replacing the year yet. This doesn't mean that research should not be looking at it. Research should be looking at it, but that's a very tough field to climb. <laughs> another question? You have another one, I think. Yeah. And also part of the Certain what matter? Uh, I don't know if I would actually like it. 
it might be called biological markers. Okay, like DNA storage, like yeah. Okay. DNA okay. Uh, yeah. Um, are there actually is there actually measures of coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, certainly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, at ETH physics department, there are people looking at DNA storage actually. Uh, and they're also an architecture community. Uh, those are usually targeted as archival storage, meaning not for DI. <laughs> so they're, uh, in, in my opinion, they're never going to be able to replace DI. <laughs> and never is a very strong word, but there is a fundamental reason, I think, because uh, those DNA storage, for example, it's a very, very slow reading process. The Re reading process is essentially very similar to what we have discussed in the genome analysis lecture. You can basically read the DNA and figure out what the data is that you encoded over there. And that takes a long time, as you can see. But people are really looking at it from a more archival storage perspective. Can we store data for I don't know, hundreds of years? Uh, and there, I think that maybe uh, there may be some applicability. But the read and write times are, and also error rates. Uh, are quite, uh, let's say, not so good compared to DRAM or SSDs today. There's also other, I mean, it's, it's, it's really good to look at memory technology, I think, memory and storage, I should say. Uh, people are looking at actually storing, storing data in glass. There's work at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And that, that I think, I find that, that a little bit more promising. And short, let's say, uh, potentially uh, shorter term uh, than, uh, the DNA storage, so you can check that out. The downside is, I think, they don't get close to the air. If, you're, if your goal is to really have make fast, energy efficient memory, they're not, uh, at least in the current form, they're not there. Right? They don't even get close to SSDs in many cases. Yeah, that's the sad state of affairs. <laughs> but the good state of affairs, I think it's good to look at these things and see where they can be applicable. Any other questions? Okay, we should probably call the day then. The other question or? No, okay. Okay, let's call the day next week. Uh, we're going to start with your presentations. So we're looking forward to that. I hope you're in touch with your mentors. Okay, good. Yeah, see you next week. Thank you.